day, good day. Good day to the seven continents of the world, Antarctica, Australia, Asia, Africa, North America, South America. We are back. It's Friday. It's Atlanta Discuss. We always have something that has to, that's important that we have to discuss. And in our tradition, we bring erudite scholars, people that know their onions, people that end their epaulets, people that know their left from their right, people that are true to power. So today, we're still back in Nigeria the nation with the largest concentration of black people in the world. And we have one of our most erudite in the house, most erudite scholar, uh, well-known, that's Professor uh, Mwakobia, Mustafa Mwakobia, Junior. <laughs> Did I get it right, Junior? Yes, welcome to Atlanta. Today, we're going to talk about state of the state. Yeah, the state, the country, yes. But we're talking about the states in the, in, in, within the state. We're talking about the 36 states of Nigeria. There's so much focus and attention on the federal government. And the federal government has also, you know, tried to push some responsibility to the state. That The focal point should also be on the state. There should be a trickle-down effect in governance and what have you. That's why today the topic is state of the state. With Professor Wakobia. Professor Wakobia, once again, welcome to Atlanta Discuss. The pleasure is mine. I'll be good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Anyway, Prof, you know, we always have to go for the juggler. A lot has been happening, you know. It's been a while you've been with us. I know you're very busy, you know, patriotic gesture here and there, you know, working for the people. But you recently made a statement, you know, which I, you know, I have to read to our people, you know, because a lot of people saw the statement, but not everybody. And uh, let me start this way. You said, I shall query what goes on in the state. I shall also demand respons responsible and responsive leadership at the center. He said, since the end, bad governance protests have been inundated with requests and seek to lead a group of NGOs in proactive advocacy across the state of the Federation. The mission is to access and assess and call out the state that are not delivering on democratic dividends to their people and to hail and applaud and encourage the state that are doing good and uh, continue to do so. Now, my question to you is this. Are there states that are doing well in Nigeria? I think very interestingly, um, <laughs> I'll start with the fact that um, that piece that I wrote went very viral, as though uh, people were waiting for that um, trajectory to be open, if you like. Mm -hmm. And the very moment I wrote that piece, uh, before I did precisely, I had about five, six NGOs that were me, you know, constantly asking that uh, I lampoon less the federal government and look at what obtains at the level of the states. It was a barrage. At some point, people were beginning to say, your state receives the highest allocation, that's Delta State. And you haven't called out your governor, you haven't called out your commissioners, and every so often you're throwing darts and daggers at the federal government. So I I looked at it and I said, okay, charity begins at home. Uh, let me address these fundamental issues. Let me talk about governance at the level of states. And then interestingly, uh, coming straight to your question, are there states that are doing well? Yes, there are. Uh, there are a few states that are doing profound. Uh, the state of Bornu, uh, where Zulum holds sway. The state of Abia, where Governor Alex Oti holds sway. Uh, there is also the man in Niger who has uh, risen up to the challenge. Uh, there are a few states here and there, but fundamentally, uh, the state governed my, by my very dear friend, Peter Mba, tops the notch, tops the chart. He He's doing profound, and uh, I salute what he's doing. Uh, when he got in as a governor, he told the people that he wasn't just going to leave his mark on the stance of time, but that uh, he was going to do things differently. And largely, at the, I'm not here to praise him, but largely, uh, he's a governor who in a year and, a, and four months, uh, you know that Enugu State has the highest number of CCT coverage, CCTV coverage in Nigeria. Not even Abuja has that much. Uh, and Enugu State has about 80% uh, 
water pipe bone water supply all that done within a year and about four months and then he's building simultaneously uh, across two uh, across the wards of Enugu state is building in 152 wards uh, smart schools and uh, healthcare centers so he's doing a lot you know and that's why the united nations and several international agencies have found Enugu an attractive port but that's by the way i think that uh, the very few governors who are doing well should be a challenge to the other states and other governors. Because if they were to, if they were to, don't mind the dog, if they were to challenge for good governance, can you hear me well? Loud and clear, go ahead. Yeah, if they were to challenge for good governance, uh, if they were to do what they're supposed to do, then we'll have a nation that is largely better. Uh, I, I know that... Um, like I stated in that write-up, over 52% of allocations that are accrued to the center, uh, that accrues to the nation, goes to the center. So the center is still uh, the strongest part. The box, the largest box stands, uh, remains at the table of its president. And if you're aware, we have in our constitution uh, the exclusive legislative list, we have the concurrent legislative list, and then we have the residual legislative list. And the federal government controls most of what goes on. So uh, the blame largely will still lie at the door of the deaths of Mr. President. But going forward, I think that uh, if we begin to ask the sub-regional governments to sit up and do right, uh, largely uh, the, there will be a comparative uh, plus, if you like, there will be some kind of positive flux in governance because um, the center will be challenged to look at what is happening in Enugu State, in Abia State, in Bono State, in Niger State, and to a large extent in uh, Oyo State, you know. And they would understand that if governance is working at the level of the sub-regional governments with uh, very little resources, then... If perhaps we'll get restructuring, we'll have governments and governance doing better. So I think that largely what is important, and that's what I've told Nigerians quite interestingly, Adi, since that write-up, um, about 26, 25, 26 NGOs, CBOs, and CSOs have reached out to me, and they're saying to me, Professor Wong Kobe, I are ready to work with you in ensuring that the sub-regional governance a call to responsible and responsive leadership. We're interested in working with you to ensuring that the sub-regional governments are accountable to the people. We're interested in working with you to ensuring that things work well at the level of the sub-regional governments. And by Jove, ensuring that government largely at the center is responsible and responsive to the people. All right, thank you. So uh, two quick follow up on that. Yeah, that's when you were calling out the states. You know, I was even going to ask that uh, is there no state in the southwest? But you mentioned for your state. Now you called Bonu, Abia, Maidan, so plus oil. That's five. I mean, that's slightly over ten percent out of thirty six. That's still very poor and very low. So uh, my question is: Have you started that process? And if that process has started, the process of uh, looking at what's happening in the state, what they're doing with the money, governance and all that, as that process started, and what does the process entail? We're organizing already. Um, we're organizing already. We're comparing notes. We're, you know that, interestingly, there is a Freedom of Information Bill. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we tidy up the protocol, we shall begin to reach out right to the states, the, the states to humbly and honorably open their books because um, it's on record that uh, within the past one year and a few months, my state, for instance, has received well over $260 billion. That's besides um, the internally generated revenue. And several other states have received between $140 billion and that $269 billion. So um, the questions are simple. What have they done with these resources and what are they doing with these resources? And uh, we have to do a comparative assessment between what is on paper and what is on ground. 
And then um, collectively, God willing, we'll be able to call the states out. If they're doing well, we'll hail them and tell Nigerians how well they're doing. If they're doing poorly, we uh, reach out to Nigerians and call them out. And, you know, we'll do what we call name and shame. We'll tell the people how badly they have done and challenge them to doing better. I think that by and, uh, by and large, what we we're saying is like that popular cliche of mine, um, uh, opposition is a pristine truth in the city called patriotism. And truth is a beautiful boulevard in the street called nationhood. So I, I think that uh, what we must do is to tell them that we're not coming as hitters, we're coming as um, fellow countrymen who are interested in ensuring that governance is responsible and responsive to the people, you know. And uh, what it ultimately entails is that if we continue to do that, and proactively so, we shall have governance at the sub-regional level that is responsible to the people. All right. So uh, another quick follow-up on that. You mentioned Bono and Niger states. I mean, clearly, I mean, based on available information, I'm sure you are aware of, those states are both, they're both bedeviled with some level of insecurity. Boko Haram, we know, is still insurgency. It's still very much in the <laughs> states. You know, a lot of them have been rehabilitated, paid, trained, and all that. And it's still there, you know. But no, I don't know how many uh, local governments is under the control of the state or the federal government, but we know that problem is still there. So, and Niger, if you look at statistics, Nigeria, I've read so many reliable uh, uh, organizations, media, and all that, that Nigeria has the highest number of uh, Christians that have been killed in the last five, six years, you know, Red Cross and so many other. So while it may be subject to debate and ratification, we don't know a lot of Christians. Are so when you mention Bono and Niger, which areas definitely not security? So that's what I'm trying to say. Which areas has the governor of Bono excelled? Which areas has the governor of Niger State excelled? That's my question. Interestingly, uh, Adi, you know, the, the point is that it's a massive contrast. It's a massive surprise that the state uh, badly harangued and harassed by insurgents and terrorists, uh, perhaps, uh, ironically, the state that are doing best in the north. It's a huge contrast, um, you know, because uh, over the past 10 years, um, on the minimum, Bono State has been the theater of uh, terrorism and terror. Bono State has been the home of insurgents and bandits. And um, since Zulum came, He's been doing quite a lot at rehabilitating the people. He's been doing quite a lot at ensuring that the schools are back. He's been making provisions for the welfare of the people. And don't forget that uh, the Constitution provides for uh, the safety and protection of lives and properties as a major reason for which governments exist. And largely, the instrumentality of uh, advancement of security lies at the table of Mr. President. That's why he's called the Commander-in-Chief. And so um, if you are unfortunate to have a commissioner of police that doesn't like you, he will sabotage what you're doing in your state because he commands the police. And a simple police officer, a sergeant, can say to you as the governor, sir, I'm not going to take instructions from you, but from the IG of police states. But Zulum... Babagana Zulum has been able to reach out to the security agencies, is collaborating with them and the civilian uh, joint tax force and the civilian uh, segment of the tax force that are largely hunters and uh, vigilantes. And they are doing the best they can to ensure that their local governments and their towns are protected. And then if you know, several villages that were otherwise uh, deserted. Some uh, refugees are returning back to their villages and government is making provisions for them at the level of the states. What he's doing is amazingly profound in a state harassed and harangued by terror and terrorist elements. And Niger State amazes me, you know, 
uh, with the challenge of insurgents and bandits and the threats to farmers and their farmlands, he has been able to begin what you call some kind of amazing revolution with respect to agriculture. And then he's helping uh, through the vigilantes and uh, hunters and state-created paramilitary agencies uh, support the farmers. It's amazing that you see a governor who is able to assess the farmers directly, a governor who is able to reach out to the people. At some point, uh, the rumors got to us that the federal government wasn't too happy with him because he called out uh, Peter B as his mentor and talked about the fact that uh, governance must be of service to the people, not about respect. Uh, of certain godfathers. Uh, I, I think that uh, he's shown largely a commitment to making life better for the people. But we desire more. The states deserve more. You know, you don't get so much resources and give pretty little to the people. So the the effort that we're trying to, to bet and bet is targeted at, at ensuring that the state governors become increasingly more responsible and responsive to the people. And, and thank goodness that the Supreme Court has um, done what is salutary and salutable uh, by um, ruling for the autonomy of the local governments. And now that we have some level of autonomy at the local government level, we shall, as the time goes, beam our searchlights to the local governments. But now we're starting with the states. And very, very soon, Ade, you will see the the actions everywhere because we are not going to let the momentum die. We're not going to go to sleep and allow the massive support and the call out uh, to the you, uh, to the country first movement, which uh, perhaps is leading this challenge, uh, we're not going to let people down. We're going to uh, we're working on the protocols. Effectively, you'll see uh, the action, and you see the momentum, and you see the fervency. Oh, fantastic! So now, uh, I'm sure you read what the exercise of the group he said some time back. And it, I think it was one of his interviews. He said that if as president, that if he is president, if he's if he's not taking part in contract as an individual as an incumbent president, if his wife is not taking contract, if his kids are not enmeshed in the same thing, that more than fifty percent of the problem will be solved. That means that the people beneath him, ministers, governors, the Chukuda effect will be that I'm not corrupt, so it will be difficult for them to put tip their hand in the cookie jar since he's not doing it. And almost uh, recently, uh, retired justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Augie, lady, I'm sure you watched that interview, when she said that Nigerians are actually very dedicated people, that when they see you get to a position, they watch you. When they see you want to do the right thing, they will really, really support you and do the right thing. But when they see that you are amenable to dipping your hand into the cookie jar, they will aid and abet you more than even yourself. So my question really is that in recent times, we have seen that the Cuban president, some members of his family, we've heard about what's happening in NPC, the Wando relationship, which, I mean, the president is a minister for petroleum, and uh, while it's in maybe it's like your family member is having some relationship, you know, with uh, some financial relationship, which does not seem transparent with the NPC. We had when uh, Mr. Dangote mentioned the issue of um, Malta refinery and so on and so forth. So now, based on what you want to do with the 36 states of the country, you know, putting a satellite on defense there, don't you think that if at the leadership level, I'm talking presidential now, if the transparency is not really there, the trickle-down effect might just be, be an effort in futility. Don't you think so? No, we agree that largely the the Japanese would say that the and is a cliche that is almost worldwide mm. that the fish mm. that's the cranes that getting rotten from the head, you know. And the Japanese would tell you that leadership is a pyramid that comes from top, 
to bottom. And then my late father would say to me, maybe you don't ask of a prostitute, uh, her 18-year-old daughter to come and pass the virginity test. You don't come to the house of an armed robber to ask of the 14-year-old son or 18-year-old son some moral rectitude. All the child knows is larceny and thieving. And so, very unfortunately, that's why I said that until now, people will tell you that uh, the states have an alibi, which is that the federal government is not doing it right, and they get so little, you know. But the point is that if we show willingness to challenge for responsible and responsible action, both at the state and at the federal level, um, we, we shall largely <laughs> ensure that things begin to change. But uh, back to the contracting and contractual protocols of government, uh, uh, the argument the argument to with that uh, the government and executive should not be responsible or involved in the, the, the giving our contracts and uh, governmental favors. I totally agree that there should be boards at the level of the state and the local government as well as the federal government. A board that should be responsible first to assess what is badly needed, second, call tenders. Uh, open buildings, and thirdly, to ensure that the companies that are most uh, proper and uh, and competent to handle these jobs are awarded the jobs. Where uh, a president gives that a job to a company that he has vested interest in, verifiably, mm-hmm. one of them is a company who pretended by his nephew uh, Wale Tinubu, and the other one is a company where his own son, so Tinubu, has uh, established interest. Uh, you ask yourself, where is the uh, transparency? And then you ask yourself, where is uh, uh, submission to the oath of office that he took, which is to be fair, transparent, and not to be self serving? You know, so, but when you have. Uh, a nation where leadership and governmental protocols is winner takes it on, where you have sick of fans everywhere and people who do not care if the constitution is obeyed in the breach, and people who do not care whether the president or the governor stays to the oath of office that he took, then we're all in trouble. So that's exactly why we have come to say that. Um, most times, the enemies of government are those who are closest to the governmental uh, operator. Most times, uh, and I've said time and again that Mr. President should check those who are within his immediate uh, uh, enclave, so to say. He should be careful about those who uh, he sees first in the morning and those he sees last at night. Uh, he should uh, also ensure that those who are very close to, to him are those who truly want him to succeed. Because if I were close to Mr. President, I would say to him, uh, such a big project is going to be a legacy project for you. Get the most competent company. As I talk to you, we know that the company that the concession or gave the contract for the Lagos Calabar Coastal Road has been working on a particular road in Lagos for about 15 years. If you haven't been able to finish it, how can you build a road that costs through about 700 kilometers? You know, so these are fundamental issues, you know, and uh, I think that those who truly are, are close to Mr. President do not advise him rightly because whatever you do with such a legacy project is going to be uh, what defines your presidency. That's point number one. Then point number two, for the president to be serving as a minister of petroleum and the person who is in charge of the downstream outlet division of the NMPC Limited, which is supposedly owned by government, is your nephew, and he got control of about 46% of the shares to handle that under your presidency, under your watch as the Minister of Petroleum. Then the questions and beggars the answers, uh, the questions about your 
interest to ensuring that government is free, fair, and transparent. It beggars the questions that uh, calls you out as being nepotistic. It beggars the questions that calls you out as uh, corrupt. And it raises fundamental issues as to how interested in moving the country forward you are. And I, I believe that um, that said, it also will not serve as a defense for the wholesale larceny, the wholesale corruption, the wholesale uh, malfeasance, the wholesale looting that occurs across the state of the Federation and the local government areas and development centers. Okay, fantastic. I, I, I like the way you put it, and that, that's one why we, we always like having you always street to power. You say the way it is. But what are you going to do differently when you are looking at the state? Because, I mean, I'm sure you agree with me that a lot of people are, I mean, between me and you, I mean, most of the states you mentioned here, I, I agree on something. But we all know that a lot of states are not doing anything. Kogi State, we know, has never been lucky with a good governor. You know, some states are, you know, but nobody really gets penalized. Nobody really gets punished. Nobody really, you know, we have these agencies, EFCC, ICPC, you know. Okay, let's look at Yaya Bello, for example. This guy has security police only. The police said they withdrew no security from him. And this is a guy you want to arrest. I mean, what is there, those policemen? you know, working with him, arresting him or something like that. So my point really is that with what you want to do, which is no go, how, when you expose the malfeasance, will anybody be penalized? What are you going to do differently that has not been done before? Yeah, let me tell you what happens largely. Sometimes uh, we expect the uh, EFCC, the ICPC, and several, uh, the SFU, never to get the job done. But it, it's almost always very difficult to get the job done. It's almost very difficult because we have a tradition that has taken away from fundamental issues and we romanticize corruption. We, we, we have given several nice sounding names to corruption. But it was Fela who said a long time ago, that uh, he doesn't understand these beautiful names, money laundering, uh, corruption, executive lawlessness, uh, and all sorts, that they try to beautify uh, Lassene. That he would rather we have a nation where uh, we're able to stay only when a governor steals. That is actually and frontally called the person a thief, you know. And then it was Dim Chukwemeke Dubogojuku who said long time ago that the reason he has refused to be called a chief is because uh, the chief sounds very much like thief. You know, remove the T and put the C and vice versa. And I, I, there's a particular thing that goes on in the United Kingdom uh, they call uh, name and shame. You know, there is something we must learn to do in this country. If a man has stolen your money, whether he be governor, a council, or a local government chairman, a member of the Senate, a House of Representative member, call him a thief. When you call him a thief, and you do so effectively, efficiently, and effusively, what it does is that those who are related to and related with him will call him out and say, we don't like this title. You know, when you begin to say, oh, corruption and corrupt proclivities, when you begin to romanticize uh, corruption, you find that the people are willing to to see what they are doing as bad. And they are able to say, oh, until, this, until I'm proven guilty. And you know that the mills of justice grinds very slowly. And in this country, it almost does not grind at all. Mm -hmm. You know, so like you noted, um, oftentimes the EFCC will 
regard you in the news with how much someone has stolen. And at the end of the day, you see little or no convictions. You know, um, someone brought to my notice recently the fact that a few years ago, it was Ribad who said that uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu was, in fact, one of the most corrupt political operators in Nigeria. Today, he's the one singing his praise and walking his security. He's the national security advisor, you know, and that's how it's been. You know, the more things uh, change, the more they are apparently remain the same in Nigeria. And you ask yourself, how do we get out of the cesspool? How do we untie this naughty and nasty north that seemingly hangs over our country? And I tell you, when people begin to see the truth and call out the government, when people begin to speak up and speak out, you know, there is nothing really that puts the government on its toes like very strong and effective critical mass. When you begin to look at the governor uh, and you see some kind of untoward um, appropriation of our collective teal and resources, you see profligacy at the highest level. You see looting and larceny, and you call him out as a thief. He begins to look strongly at the people who are calling him a thief. You know, you see a man who yesterday had just one house, and after four years he has twenty properties. And you ask yourself, where did he get it from? He's just a thief. You know, when you see people who, uh, before they got to the national assembly, had no house and. In four years, they have several properties and cars everywhere. What a day. It's a thief. That's what a thief is. You know, so I think that the time has come for us to understand that what we're about to do, you know, it, we would love to be taken to the courts of law and asked why I'm calling you a thief. And you, like what happens in criminal jurisprudence in other parts of the world, you are made to prove that you're not a thief, you know. And I think that largely we have to change our uh, uh, our prosecutorial uh, protocol to not the accuser proving, but the accused showing that he's innocent. That's what happens in most part of the world. You know, if you are a political operator and people are accusing you of uh, larceny, people are accusing you of looting and wasting their collective pill, you prove that you, you did not or you have not wasted the the people's collective pill. You prove that you have not helped yourself to a national kija. And that's actually what uh, is expected. So God willing, when this new vehicle gains momentum and speed, um, Nigerians will be proud of the initiative that we have decided to undertake. Great, 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 great. So uh, you said we must name and shame them. You know, I really caught that. We must name and shame them. I mean, it does look, I mean, from almost all indications, maybe not all, but more than 90% of the indicators that that shape does not apply in the Nigerian scenario because even from your local community, your village, your local government, when you get federal appointment, state appointment, you are seen as an ambassador to go and make money and bring to your people. Nobody really cares, you know, the source of income. You mentioned that in, in the old days, like Fela said, that if you still be a thief, you know, there's no way, there's no, there's no way around it. What is bad is bad. But this time around, it does look different. Now, what am I trying to say in a nutshell is that recently, I'm sure you've read recent statistics by international body that said the Nigerian judiciary is now more corrupt than the Nigerian police. As a matter of fact, they got more bribes, you know, with empirical kind of evidence more than the Nigerian police. That is, that is very shameful. You know? And nobody in the judiciary at the highest level or the middle level has come out to deny or, you know, just speak against that, you know. Now, if we want to get things done. And I know you're a believer in strong institution. You've spoken in favor of it. You are pro-institution. How do we get our institution back on track? I'm talking judiciary and police, for example. I mean, the case of INEC is still there. Where, that's not why we're here today. But for corruption, you know, cost of governance, which is what we're still going into. We're talking about the state. Now, to implement all that, I said, you name and shame them. They don't care. They don't believe anything will happen to them. So, 
how do we make our institutions function? You know, let me say clearly, uh, Adi, that uh, the first thing we, we haven't done thus far in our country is naming and shaming people. I'll tell you, you know, instead, we hail them. Mm. I have seen situations where people would tell you, uh, when the other man stole, what did you do? When Buhari wasted a collective till, what did you do? That's true. Now that it's our turn, why are you fighting our son? That's how sad uh, national tip history has become. You know, so when we say name and shame, we're simply saying that uh, our approach to what happens in our country should be beyond region and religion. It should be beyond ethnicity and clannishness. It should be beyond bigotry and sectionalism. We're saying that anywhere you see someone who is putting his hands untowardly in your cookie jar, at the state level, at the local government level, and at the federal level, call him out. Name what he has done. Name him in line with the malfeasance, and let's shame him. You know, when you do that, all over the world, everybody, let me tell you uh, something my mentor, Martin Luther King Jr. once said. You live in a city, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. He said something that is fundamentally important, and I say to you, uh, that the drum major is the strongest, one of the strongest emotions of a human uh, human persona. You know, you don't want to be called bad names. You want to be called good names. And in talking about the drum major effect, he gave the story of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, who approached Jesus the Christ and asked that they be given the right to sit at the right and at the left of the master in paradise. And the master said, no, it is not my right to give you. But if you must occupy that position, go and do good. Serve the poor, serve the needy. Now, everybody wants a good name. Everyone, Everybody wants a good place in the afterlife. You know, now, when you are able to call out the people who are consistently uh, looting. I have seen governors who say, oh, this, I will sue you for calling me a thief. I will do this for, do you understand? I mean, nobody wants to, to be labeled an ex-convict. Are you aware? I know. And then, I know. Okay. Now it becomes much more uh, indicting when the people around your village, when the people in the state are unanimous in the fact that you're a thief. Think about it, Adi. Mm. You know, so I, I, what we're trying to create is a new momentum that will reignite that earliest traditional values that defined the African. My dad told me a long time ago that um, we had tradi strong traditional values such that, that if you were to misplace your money in the marketplace, if you come back to the market tender, the next day, the man who guides or cleans up the market the very next day, you're almost certain that you will find your money. And I asked him why. He said, because we had values. Nobody wanted to be called a thief. Nobody wanted to be shamed. But increasingly, and I'm sorry to say, religion, Christianity and Islam has messed up those strong values. Now people steal and they go to the church to pray for forgiveness without returning their loot. People steal and they go to the monks to do some zakat and give out some alms and, and they say that they are pure without returning the loot. And these religions oblige them. But you know, if we, uh, we were to hold up our traditional values, if you steal Ogu, you'll be scared of Ogu, you'll be scared of Burumila, you'll be scared of Ijigu, you'll be scared Scared of several, you be scared of several traditional deities and the repercussions of being called a thief amongst your kindred. You know, so I, I think that what is important, you know, what Jerry Lawrence that said a long time ago in a very fantastic interview of his, that he will advocate that everybody, that our traditional deities are not uh, 
uh, an adjunct or Pokpitanism. But they are deities. Everybody has a traditional deity in his village. If you're going to be sworn in as president, they should bring the representative of that deity that is known to your village, and you swear by that deity. If you're uh, a Christian, you swear by the traditional deities in your place. Nobody's saying worship that deity, but just swear by it, that you will protect and defend your people. That you see increasingly stealing, corruption, larceny, will reduce by over 90%. And Ade, you know it's true. So what is important is that we must redefine our collective morality when we begin to call out and shame these people. And when the young boys in their place refuse to accept a muscle of bread or a mess of porridge for their conscience, you'll find out that people, because you ask yourself, this bag of rice, this 10 kg, now it's two cups of rice that you're giving to me. Where did you get the money from? Was that what you promised me four years ago? When you begin to ask strong questions and you look at the person and say to him, when you were going four years, uh, when you were campaigning and telling me that you will govern and protect me, you had only two vehicles. How come you have 12? How come you have 10 houses now? Where did you get the money from? And the road that leads to your house isn't even well tied. Or the roads in the village, nobody has attended. You know, when people begin to ask strong questions, and you know, that's exactly what we want to start with this initiative. When we begin to ask questions, we will go to the Code of Conduct uh, Bureau, we'll go to, uh, and then check for your asset declaration match it with what we know you have acquired, and then ask you how come, and make it public, make the people understand what we're facing across board. Then uh, gradually, the reawakening of our collective morality and our conscience would, would have begun. And what ultimately will happen is that, you know, Adi, I'm actually not one who thinks that uh, the transformation will happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I am one who has told my son that when I die, just put a few words on my, uh, on that ash, because I'll be cremated when I die. Just put a few words across the bottle. You know, here lies the ash of a man who taught and worked to move humanity one step forward. I just want to be a question mark on our collective conscience. I just want to help nudge society right. I just want to ensure that leaders are much more responsible and responsive to the people. And God willing, if God gives to me the levers of power, show how it can and should be done. Wow, interesting. You know, you took it out of my mouth. I was going to ask you about the religious leaders, you know. And uh, you, you said something about the culture, the tradition, and all that, that people should be sworn into office by their traditional deity and all that. But my question is, even the traditional deity, the Christ, I mean, let's, let me put it this way. Let me rephrase it. The Christian leaders, the Islamic leaders, and the ancestral worshippers, uh, which in essence are the supposedly atheists or the traditional worshippers you are talking about, all seem compromised to the best of my knowledge because I've seen one, two, maybe three scenarios in the southwestern region, for example, where I'm from, where people became traditional. You know, to be a traditional ruler, if I has to play a role, if I are extraordinary deity with fantastic, you know, uh, uh, track record, it has been proven to work and all that. Their books have been written about it. We have the likes of Professor Wadi Abibola that written and you know it's all over but in recent time those things have been compromised you know so much so that the person everybody thinks the people want i even if i want that the, the deity goes around you know so don't let me limit to the deity now in, in recent time we heard from some geo that said they will pray and dollar naira will be one to one and <laughs> i know i know people that in Nigeria, that grew up going to a particular church, they were told that the TV is a devil box. 
Now today, that church is being powered by a lot of technology, so much so that Nigeria too, I think might be residing in Europe now and all that. So there's a lot of contradiction across across board. Now, what am I trying to say is that we have seen cases of, uh, let's say, in the Catholic Church, for example, we had Carol Wotila, who Paul the second, who was Polish. And you know, he played a serious role in how Poland came from communism to be a, uh, what you call a democratic country, you know. So I'm saying that our religious leaders, you know, be Christian, Islamic, or even the ancestral worshippers, are not helping matters, you know. And you mentioned it too. So my 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 issue here is that if they are not helping matters culturally, where minus there, you know, uh, the principle of hard work is it's it's non-existent. Because you said people still go to church, drop a tithe if a Muslim donate something, gives a card. Ancestral worshiper, the, the in fact priest or whoever deity, they give cash, not the old old dude days uh, as a sacrifice, you know. So everything goes back to the institution. They've all been damaged, you know. It's almost impossible to get the truth from anybody's mouth. Now I was just checking yesterday, you know, is there is there really somebody? You know, even during Shankari, we still have people that could say the truth, you know. I'm thinking possibly maybe Ayoko, a teacher, maybe Ayoko, and maybe two other people. There's actually nobody, in my own opinion, that can really stand up and be called to be saying the truth right now. So what am I really trying to say? Is that if the president of a country we have not seen his asset declaration for, you understand? The last time we saw it was Dori Yaradwa and Jonathan. You know? And recently in Senegal, the people that were elected in Senegal, they, they, they made their asset declaration public. So if the president has not led by example, the people have not led by example, the governors have not led by example, the code of conduct below you are claiming you want to go to whoever is in charge is a political appointee. Our religious uh, leaders are morally compromised, you know, and so on and so forth. Where is the soul of the nation? Where? One two hundred no, million people with the largest country. Where where is the soul? If all our, our cultural institutions have been defaced. Adi, let me say this. Uh that uh, your your very long vision started <laughs> from uh, started from oh, started man. from Started from a particular point and ended at that same point. Well, you know, yeah. your questions, yeah, from yeah, no, I mean, it's yeah, confusing. your questions are yeah. very germane. Yeah. Um, how well has religion helped us? And then the next one is, um, has the gods gone crazy? Have the gods been compromised? <laughs> Have the gods lost their sense of rectitude and their ability to punish? Honestly. And I still think that apart from a few individuals who masquerade as uh, having strong cultural and uh, traditional values, uh, the gods are still very potent. Mm. And this is for another day. You okay. know, the gods are still very potent. Where I have a problem is with the who borrowed in cheaply popular religions, you know, where if the president is not a Muslim, he's a Christian, and if the vice president is not a Christian, he's a Muslim, where religion has become a fundamental issue in our politics, where, you know, um, it was um, Abamir, I'm, I'm proud to quote him again, who said that religion is basically about... Uh, Profit and politics. And then um, it was Majid Fashek, may God bless his soul, who sang a song, uh, and you caption religion and politics, you know. The truth is that those who politic in Nigeria uh, trade basically with two weapons religion and region. You know, if you're Muslim, you try to take advantage of your religion. If you're Christian, you tend uh, tend to profiteer with your religion. But you know what? All these people since 1960 have increasingly shown 
that they are godish and not godly. They have increasingly shown that they do not care about the masses of our people because consistently the Christian and the Muslim have stolen and looted a collective till. And I'll tell you uh, that if we were to have someone who uh, boldly comes before the people and says, this is, I believe in the far, I believe in these traditional values and I want to be sworn in. You find out that every night when the ancestors come on him, you'll find out that the ancestors haven't gone crazy. They wouldn't even they would sweat to the ancestors. <laughs> you know, every night you will find out that, you know, our values, our gods haven't gone crazy. You know, the truth is that uh, people romanticize these religious faiths and it gives them a feeling that there is a paradise to go to, there's a jana to come to, and an all forgiving God will forgive all that you have stolen and looted, forgetting that in every faith, the Christian faith, I remember I have read something about be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. There's karma in every faith, you know. And um, the Holy Quran will say, do not suffer not a man to go to sleep or to have his sweat dry on his body before you pay him his wages. You have Muslim leaders who do not pay workers as and when due. And you ask yourself, are they truly Muslims? Are they truly Christians? You know, what we have is uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, Pharisees and Sadducees claiming to be godly and, uh, and to be interested in the truth. What we have uh, religious people who are increasingly fake but that's when we're not here to discuss religion we're here to look at how we reposition our nation for greatness and that's why i said to you that people must understand that hunger is a discriminate of your fate mm -hmm. hunger doesn't come asking whether you're muslim or christian hunger is indiscriminate of your party it doesn't come asking whether you're the apc the pdp the labor party or what have you Hunger comes when leadership fails, when the levers of production, when the levers of supply and demand breaks, when there, there are no jobs and when things are not working. And when it comes down on the people and leadership is unable to take care, like Rosper will say, at that point you get weary because when the poor have nothing to eat, they will eat the rich. At that point you get weary because when there's hopelessness and there frust there's frustration in the space, criminality becomes the, 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 the result of the people. And it was a popular American criminologist who said a long time ago that the society prepares the crime, the criminal commits it. So oftentimes when we speak and when we call out leadership, we're saying protect all of us. We're saying provide enabling environment for businesses to, to to thrive. We're saying, do the best to make life better. Because if you fail to, you know, you, you increasingly are sowing wild bean, and the nation will have less rashes. That's what's happening everywhere. Look at the North. The North, blessed by God, with amazing resources and riches in the people. We grew up in elementary social studies. We talked about the pyramids of Granot, the pyramids of Sism. We talked about rice everywhere in the north. At some point in the north, you had about 100 uh, uh, textile mills. Today, you don't have up to 10. You know, we have increasingly run down our country on account of corruption, lost any want and wonder lost. And today, we're harvesting the rashes which increasingly was a wild bean that was sown by leadership. They refused to educate the young people in the north. And so many of them have gone into cattle rostering, banditry, terrorism, insurgency, and all kinds of villainy. And then in the south, we have increasingly refused to use our wealth to create and jobs and build companies and send back people to the farms. You know, the rubber plantations have gone dry. The palm plantations have gone. 
and the cocoa fields are now dry because government increasingly has failed to invest in the people and in agriculture. And what do we have first? Pain, anger, ritual, uh, ritualism, if you like. People people who are engaged in all kinds of uh, untoward act, acts and activities. And then kidnap for ransom and the likes. So I think that what we must do as a people are the is to begin to think about beyond the call for restructuring is a call for a recalibration of our collective moralities and values. And save and accept that is done. Save and accept we we'll look inwards and rework our collective values. Save and accept we we'll push the pillars and the levers of restructuring in this country and effectively demand that Mr. President begin to do that immediately. Our search for a new republic that works for all will be like the wait for Godot. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's uh, Professor Wakube. speaking like a patriot always. So we take a short break there. And uh, now I want us to, after the break, I'm going to go into the state proper because I know you know a lot about this state. You've done a lot of research and all that. And, uh, so let's talk about it. There. Okay, we're back again. You said something, said, there's a lot of insecurity everywhere. I mean, we know almost every of the six sub region is bedeviled with some sort of insecurity. We have we know the problem with the southeast, the south south. Yeah, maybe not like before, but there's still a lot of oil bunkering going on, which is the question I'm really going to ask. Now, you know. now we can meet up our OPEC quota. You know, we all know that the federal government controls the security apparatchik of the country. We can meet all our OPEC quota. Share up is complaining that when they pump from one flow station to the other, maybe just about 50% or 60% of what just pump gets to the final destination. Now, we're speaking institution and we're saying all this, we're going around in circles. Why is it so much to, why is it so hard to deal with oil theft? Oil theft. What's, what's, why is this such a big problem? You know, we're going to go into the state shortly, but I, I really need you to talk about that. Yeah, from Delta. I know Delta is a major. Let me let me mm-hmm. let me answer this question with uh, with a quote from the former military head of state that is one of the most vilified and most lampooned in our history city, uh, the late Sunny Abacha. He said, "If insurgency survives one full day, and some said he said if insurgency lasts for a month." It was one full day he was talking about. Know that the government has a hand in it. Mm. As deep. You know, because as a military man, he knew that uh, somehow they would be able to crush uh, insurgency. 